Hello, and welcome to a key listen podcast. My name is Sid Powar, and I'm the Supply Chain Center of Excellence Director at Akili, as well as your host today. For this episode, we proudly present the first discussion of our Aki Listen series, Blockchain for Supply Chain. Today, you'll be listening to an interview with Dan Iyer, co-founder and CEO of Blockchain, to discuss blockchain benefits for supply chain and how it will help transform organizations and their supply chain. Thanks for joining us, Dan. Thanks so much for having me, Sid. So let's start with a uh, brief introduction about you and kind of your background. How did you start blockchain? What, what kind of led you to that point? And give our listeners a little bit of, you know, who you are. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, we, we go a ways back, Sid, but uh, for the audience here, I'll, I'll just give them a little <laughs> bit of background on um, myself. So I had kind of a, an atypical career uh, trajectory to get to where I am today. Uh, And really that started in industry. Uh, So supply chain and management of information systems for um, originally a very large company called DuPont, Fortune 500, uh, you know, multi-business line conglomerate kind of thing. Uh, They produced a lot of different products, uh, had a lot of uh, different business units that I interacted with in various capacities. And that gave me a really good flavor of just the myriad ways that supply chain could manifest uh, Mm -hmm. across the globe. And so I was doing work with uh, performance polymers, was doing work with protective technologies like bulletproof, fireproof, tearproof type uh, materials, uh, crop protection, Mm -hmm. uh, crop engineering. Uh, And then eventually what brought me out out west here uh, to to the Bay Area was uh, eventually semiconductors uh, and the manufacture of those semiconductors and distribution of them. Right. Uh, and while I was working in the semiconductor industry, um, you know, deep, I'd say knee deep in, in the supply chain itself, uh, I was approached by a company called Anaplan, uh, which is actually where you and I met uh, during mm-hmm. the time that I was there. Yep. Uh, and Anaplan was an enterprise planning, modeling and analysis platform uh, to enable large organizations to scale business process in a way uh, that matched the way that they did business, uh, which was unique. I mean, you have a lot of these sort of other uh, ecosystems built by the likes of, of large enterprise uh, services and software providers like SAP and Oracle and everything. And it, it just, it, it was kind of the next generation of software. So it was, it was an exciting time. Uh, I joined Anaplan uh, as one of their very early uh, supply chain gurus, if you will. Yeah. Uh, to, to kind of build the applications uh, and uh, processes and whatnot uh, that I wished I had had when I was working for a large company. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so after a while of doing that, um, I transitioned into uh, leading a machine learning strategy uh, for the corporation for, for Anaplan. Uh, and I mean, you know, uh, as well as I, that uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, have a lot of intersections with supply chain uh, by their very nature. It's a very data rich industry. Right. Uh, you know, the, the value of a, a really good forecast or, you know, being able to incorporate that and get better accuracy is is paramount uh, in an industry that, you know, you're really just looking to be as lean as you can. Correct. Uh, and so uh, that was a very interesting time, just looking at, you know, the ways that many different organizations could interact with one another and and just the value of that data. And that's really where I started diving deeper into blockchain. Uh, And so personally, I had been investing in crypto uh, and Mm -hmm. we'll get into, you know, the crypto aspect of blockchain later, I'm sure. Uh, But, you know, you, you almost have to separate them initially, blockchain and crypto to understand uh, where supply chain kind of fits into, to all this. And so, you know, crypto as a, as a personal investment and, and doing some mining and everything on the side uh, was a passion of mine. But when I was looking from a professional perspective at blockchain as a way to, to scale enterprise systems, a lot of things clicked into place for me. Uh, so, you know, one of the challenges I'm sure you're very familiar with and, and many other supply chain professionals out there would, would be familiar with this too. When you have let's take the semiconductor industry, for example, you have thousands of participants, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Large corporations, small corporations, uh, everyone's supply plan uh, relates to everyone else's demand plan. 
and vice versa in some way or another, right? Yep. Uh, and sharing information is very, very difficult. And the fact that it is so difficult means that it's not happening too often. And you get this bullwhip effect where, you know, the latency in that information causes these disruptions uh, in supply to, you know, what would normally be a precise and accurate demand plan. Yeah. And oftentimes I think, uh, you know, it's the sharing of information, but I think what I've run into, and you've probably seen this is it's also the lack of information because they just don't have the history. They don't just don't have the stuff to be able to share with, you know, your customers or your suppliers. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, Mm -hmm. so I think, um, you know, just the initial kind of problem there of, uh, how do you, when you do get information, how do you share it uh, more openly? Yep. Um, this gets into the issue of how do you scale a permissioned environment, right? Mm-hmm. Most systems require that uh, you give explicit permission for another party to access data. And when they do access that data, it's very, very, you know, granular permissions, very specific data. Right. Uh, and If you can imagine trying to scale a network of, say, a thousand corporations that all need to share this data uh, in in varying ways, well, how do you manage that without it becoming an exponential problem? You'd be managing permissions uh, at a greater scale than you'd actually be managing business process. Yeah. Uh, And so that that got into the the nature uh, of, you know, in the, the theory behind uh, distributed data vending uh, mm-hmm. and how blockchain kind of factors into the supply chain uh, mm-hmm. at the you know the, the outset here, which is a way to scale interactions mm-hmm. between corporations uh, without having to worry about permissioning individual users or individual corporations, uh, but rather using this technology to enable more free flowing. Uh, data and more free flowing information uh, right. that that would enable you know this to to scale with much higher efficiency uh, and so that's what I was really looking at uh, at the tail end of my time uh, over at Anaplan uh, and um, you know I just saw this the crypto space and the blockchain space is uh, you know the next big thing of course machine learning and artificial intelligence are are growing fields as well uh, but I saw a prerequisite to a lot of this e- ecosystem developing just being uh, you know, the, the, uh, the integrity of, of the database, the integrity and the information. And I wanted to get involved in that. And so, um, you know, a good friend of mine uh, started blockchain with me. Uh, he came from a, a background in uh, nuclear power facility security and uh, chemical weapon destruction facility, um, you know, design and engineering. Um, so he's very familiar with, with, with high grade security and, and secure environments. Yep. Uh, and we started a digital asset investment platform Mm -hmm. Uh, for registered investment advisors and and institutional investors to access uh, investments in in digital assets uh, and blockchain. And that is what blockchain is, yeah. So uh, mainly for, uh, I guess, investment firms to be able to help their clients. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, great background. I mean, yes, we worked, you know, together in the past um, and on supply chain use case specifically. very interesting area. Uh, always, I feel like the the technology uh, tends to lag in supply chain when you know you're you're trying to catch up. But the last you know few years have been really exciting with uh, blockchain because the applications are so many. So with that, um, you know, let's just start with the basic question: What is blockchain? Yeah. So uh, blockchain has become almost synonymous with distributed ledgers. Um, blockchain at its core, because there, there are a number of different blockchains, right? The initial uh, and kind of original one is, is the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, which has seen a lot of usage, real world usage, uh, is being adopted by a lot of uh, institutions and you know even sovereign funds are, are buying uh, Bitcoin uh, these days. So, so governments are, are backing their currencies to some extent by it. Right. Um, but there are many different specialized use cases for blockchain as well. Uh, and so if, if you step back and you look at what is blockchain really doing or what's the purpose of it, it's really to create as many copies, uh, verifiable copies uh, of database entries as possible. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you were to try to uh, destroy the integrity of a database entry, mm-hmm. when you're working with a centralized system, 
uh, like maybe you're, you're storing it on a, a cloud server somewhere, you've got it on your computer. Mm-hmm. You only need to tamper with it in one location, one location. And that, yep. that creates a, you know, the central point of failure. Mm-hmm. So any system that relies on that can collapse if that's compromised. What the blockchain does is it creates essentially records of transactions uh, that are uh, referencing one another throughout time. So they create, you know, each subsequent block references the signature of all previous blocks. Right. Uh, so you, you can kind of verify it through time. And then it also creates this massive redundancy uh, across everyone that's got a copy of the ledger. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you uh, initiate a transaction on the blockchain, uh, everyone's notified. Uh, of that transaction and everyone stores a copy of the transaction, they don't need to know who you are. So it's still, you know, anonymous or in a lot of cases, pseudonymous. Right. Um, But at the end of the day, there's no way that anyone's going to be able to compromise the integrity of that transaction. And that's what makes it so powerful is that it's, it's extremely secure, uh, which is, you know, data security is, is the first kind of building block for any, large system that you're looking to scale uh, across any, you know, uh, mission critical use case. Right. Uh, And so with that, um, I think one of the big things for blockchain is that the fact that you can trust blockchain and um, does that uh, with it being as, as you mentioned, you know, distributed ledger or something that's distributing, you know, not putting um, the data in one location where it can be easily hacked. It is distributed across, you know, multiple computers and, um, you know, and it's the redundancies where if there's a single point of failure, there's obviously, you know, the redundancy that protects it from completely collapsing. So with that, I think it would be more trustworthy of a you know process, and in supply chain, or for that matter, in, in financial systems, it becomes that much more important. So blockchain plays, you know, at least theoretically, would play a much bigger role because it is more trustworthy. So, is is that what we're you know is that the selling point of blockchain that it is more trustworthy? Yeah. So I think it's. Um... The, the trustworthiness of the blockchain itself is, is an interesting concept, right? Mm-hmm. So this goes back to, you know, kind of the Byzantine generals problem of, you know, if, if you don't know what the plans are of any other entity, yeah. you know, how do you ensure that, you know, one entity isn't going to essentially corrupt the, the, the entire process for everybody else? And it's sort of like you kind of have to round up uh, the, the plans of everyone or mm-hmm. all the actors and kind of compare them before time, uh, you know, beforehand, and then essentially move forward from there. Um, I think that the trustworthiness of, of the blockchain versus other parties is paramount here mm-hmm. because historically one corporation, for example, trading goods and services with another corporation you really need to evaluate the the creditworthiness of that organization. You right. need to qualify things like the you know their product. You need mm-hmm. to understand what the the spec that they're operating to is, right. and 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 what the outcome is before you receive product mm-hmm. to make sure it's up to your quality standards. You need right. to ensure that you know every step along the way the correct things are happening uh, and they're they're trackable and traceable. With blockchain, the the idea is that you get this immutable, incorruptible record. Mm -hmm. Uh, of what happened and you don't need to trust another entity to do it, another person to input that data. And Mm -hmm. I think that's, what's really revolutionary there is that the reliance is no longer on other parties. So the the, the kind of human error that you would see uh, isn't nearly as prevalent here. So um, in that scenario uh, that you're just describing, the parties involved don't have to know each other, right? In, right? in, in today's supply chain world where, you know, I have a supplier uh, or many suppliers and I'm the customer. I know all my suppliers today. Right. Uh, obviously, because I'm trying to get in in in, you know, a product from them or a service from them. But in this blockchain scenario, I don't need to know each and every one of my supplier as long as they're part of that blockchain. Right. And so this, this paints a, a future and, and we'll see, you know, what direction this goes. But I think when we talk about permissionless systems uh, in having anonymous or pseudonymous mm-hmm. uh, trade and in, uh, in all of that kind of unfolding on the, within these ecosystems, 
uh, the big element of what that brings to the table is competition. Right. And so the, the way to think about this is generally, if you want to engage uh, in trade within a network of suppliers uh, mm-hmm. for you know a particular other corporation, uh, there's going to be a future that's that's possible here where you're able to bid on contracts, and as long as your product meets the spec that's yeah. outlined, mm-hmm. and you know the the blockchain can essentially act as an escrow, uh, you know the protocol itself can act as an escrow and brokering you know, the, the quality of product that you're looking for from any number of vendors, which will drive down prices for goods uh, and, and drastically uh, increase the quality that you see at those prices. Uh, and that, that'll happen across nearly every industry, uh, especially, you know, physical good industries. Right. And so uh, I think that that's kind of the exciting thing here. And, and another element that comes into play with that, uh, when we talk about trustless systems, it's not trust just between people. Right. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. also the communication between machines from right. from an automation perspective. And that's where you really look at, you know, smart contracts, uh, which are essentially, you know, they're they're pieces of code, building blocks of code uh, that are built onto uh, the blockchain. So everyone can see them. They're fully auditable. Uh, you're, you're aware of what they're doing. Uh, and they, they basically can be chained together uh, to, to automate any kind of process in an interoperable fashion. Uh, so you could involve machines, you could involve people, you could involve entities, uh, and all of them are communicating in this kind of standard language of smart contracts uh, that are you know, very high fidelity transactions uh, right. along the way. Uh, right. And I, that's kind of the, you know, I think the future that we're, we're heading towards here. Yeah, no, very exciting. So I want to hit on two things that, you know, you mentioned, you, you mentioned smart contracts and you talked about permissionless. Um, so I want to kind of ma- make sure that our listeners and everybody who, who probably is just kind of stumbling into blockchain understand what, you know, we're talking about. So can you expand upon, you know, what permissioned and permissionless blockchains? What's the difference? I mean, I think the name itself explains it, but can you get in a little bit more into what those two, uh, you know, different blockchains um, will do and why one is good over the other for different applications. Yeah, so a a permissioned blockchain, just like any other system, requires that you identify a specific party and you define the scope of their access to the system uh, or to you as an entity on a, a protocol, for example. Right. Uh, so you're basically saying very explicitly, uh, I know who this, this entity is and here's what they're allowed to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, with a permissionless blockchain uh, or, or, or database, right? Just any technology that's permissionless, um, blockchain uh, happens to be the, one of the best examples of this, is you're essentially defining criteria uh, for entities to interact. And as right. long as the entities meet the criteria for interaction, Mm -hmm. Uh, It doesn't matter whether they know each other. Uh, They can interact directly without compromising their identity uh, or any other data uh, besides that sort of criteria, whether they met that criteria or not. Uh, And if we're talking about, you know, the the benefits of a permissioned blockchain, you know, a lot of times it can be faster. Right. And that's that's a function of really just the scaling solutions that are in place today. It won't always be true uh, that that permissioned blockchains are, uh, you know, a better fit for use cases that require information much more quickly. Uh, But today, that's certainly the case. Um, And there's a ways around that. You know, if you want to use a public blockchain, you can kind of batch transactions, essentially building some some element of centralization uh, or permissioned environment on top of a permissionless environment. Um, but you know, the, there's a lot of things that are evolving there. Now, I, I'd say, generally speaking, uh, the more you can focus on having permissionless environments, um, you know, the, the greater your interoperability is going to be with with the broader ecosystem. Because these permission blockchains, a lot of the times, while they are optimized for certain use cases, uh, they they can be a little bit more narrow. You're essentially defining yourself. Uh, within one specific ecosystem. Uh, But, you know, with permissionless blockchains, you almost have this like melding uh, or melting of the boundaries uh, between industries and and what information can be shared. 
uh, and in, in what scenarios. And I think that that's yeah. really, if we're talking about the melting pot of industry yeah. in the future, that's permissionless and, blockchains and so that are really going to win that race. You know, it's sensitive data. I mean, I'm thinking about like health records. I'm thinking, you know, um, mm -hmm. ta trade secrets, stuff like that. Uh, which type of system is there one over the other that you would consider better or it doesn't matter because it's blockchain, the trustworthiness is high. So if you put sensitive data in there, it should be secure. Um, and you know, there's really no constraint on that. Yeah, so I, I mean, today, I think there's still quite a bit of experimentation going on uh, to, you know, to develop on these public blockchains, uh, kind of the, not just the integrity, but I think also that yep. the privacy aspect is, is a major concern. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there are ways that you can get around it, right? Because I, I think, you know, to your question, a lot of solutions that you util utilize blockchain today mm -hmm. for specialized use cases like, uh, you know, healthcare records and whatnot, a lot of them actually do mm -hmm. use uh, a more centralized approach, more permission approach. Uh, because of the, you know, the fear of what could happen if you have this like permissionless right. environment and something is, is compromised, right. uh, which is, it's a legitimate concern. Um, mm -hmm. And there, there's all that regulation around it too. But on the permissionless side, I think people have become uh, quite clever with the way that they're utilizing these, these databases and posting transactions, because but what you can essentially do is anonymize the data uh, or uh, obscure uh, or obfuscate the, the data from public eyes. Because you do have to remember that everything you do on the blockchain is visible to everyone, right? And um, that's both a, a feature and, you know, it can, it can be damaging if not used correctly. Uh, but there are ways to publish these transactions, mm -hmm. um, you know, broadcast them. Right. Uh, and they, they get posted to the, to the blockchain and they're visible to everybody, yeah. but they've been hashed or they've been put through some something that creates uh, yeah. records that aren't recognizable by anybody yeah. else, except for those that hold the key uh, to, to decode that hash. So those records are secure. Uh, they're publicly available and they can be retrieved, yeah. but they can't be interpreted without the key. Uh, and so that's that's really like, you know, when you look at these these public blockchains, that's how a lot of these use cases are going to be built. And it just, you know, it's going to help massively, I think, when, you know, if, if you could go through a, you know, kind of a key sharing process uh, in very specific circumstances, I mean, you could get off the ground much more quickly uh, than if you were trying to integrate with some kind of, you know, proprietary uh, technology that someone had built from the ground up that you now need to reinterpret uh, and, and redevelop uh, versus something that is mm -hmm. just kind of, uh, ubiquitous to the extent that something like an Ethereum or another smart contract platform would, would be utilizing. Right. So, you know, if, if I were to kind of, you know, paint a real life scenario where, you know, all our health records are on a public blockchain and I have a key, uh, an encryption key, uh, and obviously there's a public key and there's a private key, right? So public keys, obviously, uh, and maybe you can explain, you know, the, the importance of both uh, and why, you know, why we have the two keys. But um, with those keys, essentially, the, the holder of that encryption key is the only one that can actually access, you know, the data. Um, so even though, you know, all that information is on the blockchain, without the key, I wouldn't be able to open my own health record. Uh, if you will, or somebody else wouldn't be able to hack into and and look at you know my details, if you will. So, is that a fair uh, summarization of what we just kind of covered? Yeah, it's it's a good way to think about it. So, yeah, on on most blockchains, um, especially public blockchains, uh, because you were you know you're kind of talking about the the public and private key there. So, yeah. the public key is really it's, it's your representation to the rest of the world, right. Of, mm -hmm. of an entity that, uh, that is you, right. It could be a corporation, it could be a person, you know, right. whatever, whatever type of entity, yeah. uh, but you can share that key without, uh, sharing your identity. That key right. is essentially, here's my, uh, my wallet or here's mm -hmm. you know, where I'm storing this information. Uh, if you want to interact with it, here you go. Now the private key, um, is essentially your way of interacting with mm -hmm. that, you know, that address, right? So right. if you wanted to uh, move, 
let's say it's it's Bitcoin if you're trying to move value, uh, or it could be you know a central bank digital currency which are which are gaining a lot of popularity with governments right now, uh, yeah. or it could also be something like art or or a digital representation of of ownership of some kind of property or product right. uh, as a, a, a non fungible token. Yeah, um, all of those things can be interacted with, but you need to have you know, this, uh, the, the permissions to do it. And the, the private yeah. key is the thing that determines that. Uh, and yeah. so, you know, if somebody else doesn't know your private key, they just have your public key, you know, they, they can send things to you, uh, right. but they can't remove anything or, or, uh, basically look at any of the records or the transactions, uh, that would be hidden behind that private key. Right. Right. Okay. So then, um, you know, really, I think, we've kind of touched a lot of points. So if you had to pick, you know, a few things about why we should get excited about, you know, blockchain and its use in supply chain, what would you kind of, you know, point as your top two or three areas that you're excited why blockchain is really going to be a transformation for supply chain? Well, so I think one, you know, kind of glaringly obvious application is just in transparency. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, you know, product goes through a black hole and then it arrives somewhere else and Mm -hmm. and you you have no visibility into what happened uh, in the meantime, or, you know, if you're, you're trying to identify inefficiencies in the supply chain, you know, where, where was the product damaged, you know, who's Mm -hmm. liable for the returns. I mean, just all those massive inefficiencies that come from not having visibility, I think is, is one obvious one. Right. And and you have other use cases uh, related to, to sourcing, uh, like how do I verify that the the product is real, right? How do I know that this is a, a real handbag, uh, from mm-hmm. the originator, well, if it's got you know a specific blockchain record on there that you could look it up, uh, well, then it's verifiable, right? Same thing with wine right. or, or anything else that it matters where it came from. Um, I think another aspect, and this is sort of the broader, more overarching uh, concept of, of blockchain in, in a future where we're seeing even more automation. Um, you know, I like to imagine a scenario where a lot of things can happen autonomously. Uh, if, if you placed an order, for example, with Amazon or any other e-commerce site, uh, that that could get posted to the blockchain, and all of the parties involved in fulfilling that order, uh, from the you know the the vendor that's listed on the you know on on Amazon or or whatever whatever site you're using, uh, through to the logistics company uh, and and uh, you know last mile fulfillment uh, type organizations they can all see that record when it's created. So they're ready to receive it. They're able to plan ahead because they, they know what the, the lead time between different steps in the process are. Uh, machines right. can also see the records and they can, mm-hmm. you know, pick up with aut- autonomous vehicles, you know, whether they're right. cars or drones or whatever, uh, mm-hmm. all of these things can coordinate, see those records. And then you have this amazing transparency throughout the process, whether it's machine to machine, uh, you know, human to, to protocol, uh, whatever it is, where you can see where the fault lies, uh, where the supply right. chain breaks down and work on relieving those bottlenecks. Uh, and, right. and you're just going to wind up with a much more efficient ecosystem, much more efficient economy. So I think, right. you know, supply chain has historically been this thing that occurs in the background. I mean, I think right. we all know that, right? It's, it's yeah. Yeah. It, There's not much glory in supply chain. Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah. okay. But I think it is really... Uh, the, uh, you know, the inner mechanics, the thing that makes the global economy tick. And I think that that's been um, coming more and more into the limelight. Well, the perfect application of blockchain is, is obviously supply chain. It's, it's not just the flow of goods and services, but it's also the flow of information. You know, when you look at like the flow of, of money, uh, it's a, with, with the Bitcoin blockchain or anything like that, you're still talking about a very similar problem problem. It's just not, it's not, good physical goods, uh, but it's value that you're moving. And so that, that chain of how value has moved and preserving the integrity of that is a very, very similar problem uh, to to what we're looking at with, with supply chain. It's just supply chain has so many more uh, nuanced use cases uh, versus just, I want to transfer value from here to here. Yeah. It's, it's funny when, you know, you talk about, you know, supply chain runs in the background until you run out of toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> or, right. or, or you run out of, you know, or at least you're not 
planning how you're going to distribute COVID vaccine. That's right. <laughs> you know, until until some real world, you know, you know pandemic level, um, is, you know, use cases arrive. You know, supply chain is kind of this unsung hero in the background, right? So, um, very exciting uh, for sure. So, when I'm looking at blockchain, I'm thinking, okay, well, there's going to be a whole bunch of transactions, right? Where we're kind of painting this picture of, hey, this is the perfect world scenario. There's going to be, you know, traceability. You can trace everything that happens. Uh, there's going to be transparency because if you you know, if you have any issues about, um, you know, sustainable supply chain, meaning, you know, if organizations want to know where is the raw material coming from, uh, making sure that there's no child labor involved and all those other, uh, you know, aspects that go with kind of uh, sustainable supply chain, you know, we're painting this picture that, oh, it's going to be great. But I think that we have a long way to go because we have the, the, the blockchain will be something will have all the transactions, will have all the records, but there's just gonna be some sort of mechanism that uh, you know, an organization or an individual can interact with that blockchain, right? It's just, you know, it's not feasible to think that, okay, there's gonna be this ledger or this you know, history of all the transactions, and then I'm gonna to have to go in and I have to dig through information. I don't think that's what we're looking for now. Uh, the way I think about it is that we have, you know, let's say we have iOS or you have Android and that's what blockchain is, but then we need apps. We need some apps that will sit on top of, you know, Android, you know, like blockchain where there'll be some apps that will sit on top of the blockchain that will be, um, that a user, they will have a user interface that can go in and say, okay, well, uh, if I'm an organization and I'm looking for certain, you know, uh, details about where this product came from, I should be able to just type in, you know, some search keys and be able to, you know, extract data out of there. So that's kind of how I think the practical application is. What are your thoughts about, you know, this app world for blockchain? Because right now we have the blockchain, uh, or at least we have the concept of blockchain, and then we'll have some sort of mechanism for the end user to interact with it, to be able to make it more usable. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think this does definitely boil down to, um, you know, what, what are you building? What kind of tools are you building to access that data? Cause remember the blockchain is just a database, right? It's a database right. that, that does something very specific and, and is, you know, the most secure database that you can have. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, it's just storing data. Right. And so, uh, this is where smart contracts come in again. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of people think about apps uh, as these, you know, wholly contained sort of things where it goes from A to Z and, and does everything that it needs to. Uh, and it's developed by one entity, uh, you mm -hmm. know, a corporation, they built this software and it works this way. Well, right. smart contract platforms like Ethereum, Ethereum in particular, uh, there are a number mm -hmm. of others, but Ethereum is the front runner right now. Yeah. Uh, it turns that model on its head and it basically says you can develop code that does anything mm -hmm. interacting mm -hmm. with the blockchain. Uh, but once you uh, essentially put that code on the blockchain as, as a unit, a smart contract, uh, it lives there. Everyone can see what it's doing and everyone can use it as a building block. Right. And so the beauty of that is you can wind up with these ecosystems where there's an international standard for how something occurs. It could be international, it could be, you know, specific to countries. It doesn't really matter, right? right. You can- There's a body of uh, or players that will agree on what that standard is. That's so right, exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah. because you have that interoperability and that, you know, common denominator of understanding of how things are built and the full mm -hmm. auditability of, of even at the code level, uh, you, you wind up being able to build these, you know, kind of amorphous type structures where it's not just, I want to build an application that, that helps me from a, a you know, fulfillment perspective. Uh, but that can start branching off into many, many different areas. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, you don't need to have these like very self-contained use cases. It, it just, you know, they connect together like Legos and you keep building on that and building on that. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, you're going to have something that's much more comprehensive and can handle many more edge cases. Because if you think about it, you know, for corporations that develop software for supply chain right. use cases, 
they need to focus on the areas where that's like, you know, we're looking at, you know, kind of Pareto, 80% of use cases fall into this bucket. And you know, there's 20% that fall in here, but they're like 90% of the effort, right? So you don't see them developing for the edge cases, but the edge cases are super important because that's really where a lot of things fall through the cracks. Uh, I think with, uh, you know, with blockchain, you can sort of focus on building uh, applications with these smart contracts and kind of snapping them together uh, for the the broader use cases first, uh, mm-hmm. where where you know most of the usage is going to be, and then you can start adding on these other edge cases uh, right. because you have this global community working on this, including enterprises, uh, yeah. and and you're just you know you're you're not trying to rearchitect with proprietary technology every single time, right. Um, so I think you hit on a few things there, um, you know, the practical use cases, um, you know, I, I think about, uh, the three, you know, three T's, if we will, in, you know, blockchain, there's, you know, the traceability we talked about, you know, being able to trace, um, you know, where the raw materials, you know, coming from, or, you know, if you wanted to trace, you know, kind of any transaction back to its origin point, that's one aspect of it. Uh, there's transparency where, you know, now because all the transactions reside on the blockchain, you know, it's, it's transparent. All the players can look in and, um, you know, uh, within, you know, a supply chain or an organization and be able to look at any, any specific data. And uh, it's not siloed, you know, approach where most organizations reside today, where they only have, you know, a very uh, narrow view of maybe the entire uh, data. And that's why, you know, I kind of stated this before where, where the lack of information comes in. It's, you know, sharing our information is okay. Well, I have, you know, I have a, a piece of the pie and then somebody else has another piece and then we're kind of putting it together to get the whole, uh, a lot of times that doesn't happen because it's not transparent. You know, we don't know right. what we have versus what somebody else has. And I think that that just solves itself. And the third thing is really, uh, being able to trade within, you know, the blockchain, right? I think you you talked about uh, NFTs, but uh, which is non fungible tokens, where you have a digital version of something that's real. Um, but within supply chain, how does tradability then become something where I can trade something via the blockchain? Is there some kind of you know your thoughts on? what that would look like, how we would be able to trade through, you know, either smart contracts or uh, how does that play out? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, it's interesting that, that you're bringing up non-fungible tokens here. Uh, NFTs are, are hot right now and it, they, they kind of yeah. took the, uh, you know, the art world by storm. I, I'm mm-hmm. sure some listeners heard of, uh, you know, the artist Beeple's uh, $69 million, million NFT <laughs> sale, yeah. which is uh, you know, the third largest sale of any living artist, which is, is a pretty right. big deal. You know, it's a milestone. Yeah. And any technology is going to go through a phase where it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of hype around it. And I think we kind of reached mm-hmm. that with NFTs, but the technology that underlies it is, is very, very real. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that is relatable to supply chain in, in a number of yeah. ways. So, you know, when when you look at the trade of goods and services, um, whether we're talking about between corporations or, you know, at an international level, like I, I like to use the example of like, you know, uh, carbon credits, right? Let, let's mm-hmm. just think about that for a minute. Yep. Right now, uh, your ability to uh, trade carbon credits dynamically uh, versus your business process uh, yep. is, is, is pretty limited. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a whole process. Whereas uh, in an ecosystem that has as low friction as blockchain and and kind of interoperability between asset classes, I mean, there's things that don't even exist right now uh, that, that we're going to see come about, whether they're derivatives or whether they're, you know, sort of these representations of uh, (laughs) ownership in, in something, or, uh, you know, a a good example is, is the, uh, the carbon credits, uh, being right. able to offset dynamically, um, the blockchain can enable you to do that. And you can essentially trade other assets 
uh, that are, are represented by other types of tokens and not have to worry about, you know, swapping into U.S. dollars and then, you know, buying something kind of off the books or, or having some sort of transaction that, that isn't directly connected. You can see and have full transparency as to, you know, why you acquired a certain type of asset, what it, rep, you know, represents uh, what you were uh, swapping in exchange for it. Um, I, I think that that's kind of the big idea here is that right. you don't need to worry about, you know, how do I exit into a, some kind of USD market first? Uh, or mm-hmm. is there a liquid market for the thing that you're trying to buy? Um, right. you, you get that, you know, deep liquidity uh, across every single asset class and a number of new asset classes arising that don't exist yet. Uh, and you get the interoperability between all of it. And I think that that's kind of the beauty is, is the reduction of friction uh, and that, that's not just here in the United States, keep in mind, that's everywhere yeah. in the world. So a public blockchain can service everyone the same way. Uh, and so you're looking at a truly global economy uh, with very low right. friction and, and, and uh, very few barriers uh, versus what we look at now, which is, is just, I mean, we're, we're talking about as many walls as you could possibly imagine for yeah. even interstate commerce, let alone right. global cur- commerce. Yeah, yeah. So... You know, you obviously Ethereum, we, you know, you brought that up, uh, you know, they definitely have a different approach, you know, in terms of how they're um, building the blockchain uh, around their, um, you know, smart contracts, you know, I think very different from Bitcoin, which is considered either a store of value or a currency, uh, whereas Ethereum is really the platform for um, you know, the smart contracts, which is essentially being able to, uh, you know, track your assets, right. Or track, uh, you know, um, whether it's, you know, digital currency or digital assets, whatever that might be. So with smart contracts and, you know, you touched a little bit about this with Ethereum being kind of the front runner, but how does this kind of the, what's the practical application that, you know, organizations could start thinking about it. When I think about it, it's, you know, if I have a work center, if I have some, um, you know, uh, CapEx expenditures and I'm looking at, you know, all my equipment that I have in house uh, and I can track it. And if I have a supplier that's using, you know, assets that, um, that either I'm paying for or uh, I need to start looking at, you know, budget for next year, uh, I'm thinking about like the practical application of being able to look at my entire landscape and then think about, okay, well, how do I um, spend money? Where do I spend money? What are the changes that are coming? Where's the demand uh, coming from? And then where do I need to start thinking about, okay, well, does supply makes more sense? You know, if it's centrally located, we all know what happened, you know, last year when everything is, you know, located in, uh, you know, whether it's China or wherever, and how do I, use all that information uh, to uh, do risk analysis, to do risk management in supply chain. That's kind of, to me, feels like all that tracking kind of ties back into a lot of the dollar spend and the the ability to do uh, things like, you know, smart supply chain planning. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think you mentioned this earlier, but I want to reinforce, it's definitely going to take some time uh, for all of this to fall into place. And, and part of that is just, you know, a lot of the building blocks are being crafted now, uh, right. but there's also the, the element of like, you know, how big does an entity need to be before this makes sense for them to do it, right? right. Uh, mm-hmm. And so um, before it becomes the global standard for interaction, there are areas that large corporations can focus on first, just baby steps, you know? And, right. and I would say like good examples of that would be, you know, having your vendors participate in, in some kind of, you know, sourcing program uh, where, you know, if you're, if you're getting, for example, truckloads, uh, uh, truckload deliveries, uh, you know, you can, you can sign a transaction at the, the, the very first weighing station to, to yeah. va- validate that, you know, the, the quantity that you're receiving at the end is the same as the quantity that was originally shipped. Uh, right. Or, you know, stamping uh, products with, whether it's on the, the label itself or, uh, uh, you know, some kind of packaging that the product is in, uh, you know, having transparency around uh, that whole process while you're manufacturing uh, all the way through delivery. So, you know, your end customers can actually 
uh, validate that their product came from the place that they thought it, uh, you know, was coming from and, and whatnot. Like these are their baby steps. Uh, not right. to say that it's not difficult to, to implement them. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't speak to, to that. Uh, but the idea here is that if you can take piece by piece of your supply chain uh, and, right. and migrate it over to this, uh, it, it's going to be a little bit of a bumpy ride at first because people are going to need to get used to it. Right. But once they do, there's going to be these monumental benefits for companies that did wind up doing that uh, from mm-hmm. the goodwill of customers uh, all the way to, you know, upstream with suppliers wanting to interact directly with you uh, because, you know, the, the, the integrity of your process uh, is, is fully transparent and they know that they're interacting with an entity that's, that's above board and, you know, sustainable and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So I, I think, right. you know, that those early use cases, they don't mm-hmm. need to be complex. Uh, they just sure. need to get you off of nothing, right? Where, yeah. where you're, you're just starting with some piece of the process, getting comfortable with it uh, and, and iterating. And I think the rest will just come naturally. Nice. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great, um, you know, I think that's a great advice uh, for how, you know, anything new uh, with, uh, I think the internet being, you know, kind of the, this is kind of internet 2.0, if you will, with blockchain is like, you know, nothing was built, you know, day one. I mean, you know, we, we had amazon.com back then and what Amazon is today uh, is, you know, completely different from, you know, what it was back in 99. Right. So um, definitely slow and steady, you know, you build upon, you know, little pieces of it and um, you know, the use cases can be very sim- simple, um, with asset tracking or with, um, uh, another one that comes to mind is stuff like, um, returns, you know, when we have product returns, I mean, every organization, uh, especially in the retail space, um, there's, uh, either buyer's remorse or product re- returns or recalls, um, by organizations. And that, and, and, it, and from personal experience, I know that, uh, product recalls are really hard for, you know, organizations and to be able to track exactly down to the batch number, you know, uh, and you know, what really is happening with that particular batch, I think is, um, you know, organizations have put in a lot of effort and money and systems to be able to track every single detail when it comes to that, uh, blockchain, I think not only simplifies that, but then also reduces the cost of being able to do that because we've thrown a lot of money, you know, I know the retail companies, especially companies that are, uh, you know, whether it's food or, you know, the, the FDA has regulations around it, you know, if they have to do product recalls, I see that all the time. I feel like that um, the amount of money spent in managing that, whether through systems, uh, through logistics, and uh, being able to, you know, just get the data uh, to be able to uh, tackle that um, is easily uh, reduced with blockchain. Am I oversimplifying it? Or do you think that there, uh, there's definitely some steps to be done to get to that? Obviously, we've talked a little bit about that. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it's about organizations needing to start getting the visibility, the transparency, and then being able to use and leverage that data to be able to uh, reduce costs in their supply chains. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think that, that that's a really great use case. Um, you know, from a returns perspective, I think you, you have a very similar, uh, benefit there to being able to, to kind of, um, achieve visibility in your sourcing process. Cause it's, I mean, to some extent it's, it's the reverse of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there probably are a number of steps that, that need to take place. Cause it, the big thing is just what is the neat packaged, uh, okay, I can start with this type mm-hmm. application where someone's figured it out and they've got a playbook for doing it. Uh, and at least early on in this, uh, kind of supply chain revolution that we're going to see here, there are a yeah. few players that stand out. I would recommend looking at a company called V chain spelled V E yeah. and then, you know, the word chain, chain. all one word. Uh, they had some very, very interesting uh, use cases that they built out early on uh, and some, uh, some early successes and in, in real world usage with, with real corporations. I mean, I think it's good to start with partners that understand how you need to interact with the blockchain and not just how you can interact with the blockchain and uh, organizations like VChain have partners. I believe PwC was an early partner of theirs 
you know, someone right. who understands business process and can help mm-hmm. you kind of implement this. Uh, because hiring, a, you know, I see a lot of times people hiring blockchain developers at, at a, a corporation that produces, you know, widgets, for example. Right. It's probably not the best use of your time because most of those yeah. blockchain developers, you know, even if they can build smart contracts, they don't really understand how those need to function. And even if yeah. they're, they're getting requirements from the business, you know, it's not particularly helpful. You're just kind of building in a vacuum. You want to build around a set of standards that are going to be the standards of tomorrow. Uh, right. and, and there's there are consortiums of businesses uh, today that are that are building on the blockchain and kind of huddling up with them and, and going through, uh, you know, an organization that that's their goal, I think is going to be hugely helpful uh, during this transformational period. Right. No, that's that's great advice. Um, I think from, um, you know, from where we are today, right, and, you know, where organizations are, uh, we, we've seen a lot of software companies like, you know, uh, we've talked about Anaplan a little bit. There are other software companies that are out there. How do they need to start thinking about helping their customers with um, not necessarily blockchain, building blockchain, but really starting to prepare organizations? because you know, companies like Anaplan really, they, they, they're built on being able to take large sets of data and being able to build this analytical layer on top of it, you know, being able to make a decision uh, dashboard. How do companies like Anaplan or, you know, software companies that are supporting supply chain use cases, they need to start thinking about, you know, blockchain and what do they need to do to prepare? There's obviously AI and then machine learning and all those other things, but really blockchain is where the exciting part is. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if it were me and, and, you know, it's, it's not today as it relates to enterprise software, but where I would focus my efforts is probably as a first step, uh, building the interface or the connection for you, for, for enterprises or, or anybody who's using the software mm-hmm. uh, to interact directly with the transactions that are on the blockchain. Because by the time you have a robust interface like that, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to have corporations that want to use it, you know, for one part of their process or another, or it's, it's sort of a chicken and egg situation uh, sometimes where it's like, well, you know, we want to be able to use it, but we don't want to be it outside of our, our standard process that we spend all this time developing in, in Anaplan or SAP or Oracle or whatever it is. Uh, you know, they, they want it to be integrated into their workflow. And, you know, you can't blame anybody for, for wanting something that's integrated. Uh, well, at the end of the day, you have to have some interface for doing that, yep. for, for querying mm-hmm. the data, processing it, uh, being able to understand it, uh, you know, if there are things that require you to, to have uh, specific keys or, or ways to decode the information that you're looking at, uh, if, if it's sensitive data on a, a public blockchain, you know, you need to have ways to, to enable that process and the transformation of that data. And, uh, you know, where does it go in the, in the databases on, you know, the, the software side? Um, right. So I think those are good first steps, just being able to interact with uh, those those large data sets. Uh, and then from there, I think we'll naturally see a lot of use cases unfold. And, and I would imagine that, you know, many corporations that build software, they're going to wind up having smart contracts that they build of their own, right? Uh, right. A number right. of different smart contracts that they bolt together, uh, even though everyone can see what the smart contracts, contracts are doing. If you build a large enough ecosystem of them, it's not necessarily proprietary, but you can right. build a gated garden uh, where, right. you know, and we saw it with the, the decentralized finance ecosystem, right? That's why right. Ethereum has such yeah. staying power right now is because that was their killer app. Everything yeah. worked with everything else. Um, right. we, we want to see that same sort of thing happening uh, in the supply chain industry. Right. That's, uh, that's really great. Um, you know, I think, then that was kind of my last question for you. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. My pleasure. It was really great to hear all about blockchain, you know, really starting from the basics, you know, understanding all the different technological terms that comes with newer technology. Um, right. I think about internet and all the words that came with it, the jargon that came with it. And I think blockchain is bringing its own jargon, you know, where you have smart contracts, uh, you have, you know, public keys, private keys, you have, uh, 
DeFi or decentralized finance and uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So there's a lot of these jargons that are coming out and I think more familiar as time goes on. So it's really great uh, to hear kind of you speak and you definitely have a lot of knowledge and understanding of this space. So hopefully our listeners uh, also benefited from that. So big thanks to our listeners for joining us on our first episode of Aki Listen podcast. Really enjoyed uh, listening to Dan talk about what it takes to build a vision for blockchain and its use in supply chain. And uh, I hope you did as well. For more thoughts and information on supply chain and Akili, visit our website, www.akili.com and stay tuned for more episodes. With that, I thank you, everybody. 